It's Thursday, July 22. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. As the number of COVID-19 cases continue to rise, authorities are looking at tightening the COVID containment measures. In June, there was an average 52 COVID cases per day. However, so far in July, there have been 62 cases per day. Prime Minister Andrew Holness told the House of Representatives on Wednesday that the subcommittee of the cabinet will be meeting this weekend to discuss the current situation. Simone Absalom Gale tells us more. Prime Minister Andrew Honess says since June 22, when the government announced the recrafting measures in Parliament, which took effect on July 1, the number of new infections have increased. Hanover and Westmoreland are of particular concern, recording a rate of increase that is two to three times that of Kingston and St. Andrew. There was a general decrease in positivity between week 11 and week 25 of 2021, from the peak of 38.9% to 6% in the week ending June 26, 2021, which is highlighted on the graph in front of us. Since week 26, however, there has been an increase in positivity. Our average positivity rate for the last seven days was 8.8%. And for week 29, the positivity rate so far is 9.9%. Madam Speaker, as the graph shows, this puts us in the high transmission range. He explains that the aim is to get the positivity rate down to 5% or below. According to the Prime Minister, Cabinet will be discussing the way forward. The purpose of my presentation to this Honourable House today is not to announce uh, any changes to the measures which currently are set to expire on August 10th. However, Based on the early, early warning signs that we are seeing, the COVID subcommittee of Cabinet will be meeting this weekend to review the situation to consider whether there may be need to tighten some of the measures in advance of August 10. He says the public will know the results of the meeting next week. He is urging all Jamaicans to exercise extreme caution. This is not the time to become complacent. I want to reinforce the need for everyone to be vigilant about observing the protocols and keeping ourselves and each other safe. Some may say that I'm being alarmist and that some amount of uptick in our numbers would have been natural, uh, seeing that we have allowed greater movement and greater gatherings. Madam Speaker, we have seen from the experience of other countries and indeed from our own experience how insidious this virus is and how quickly spikes can occur. He has renewed calls for people to take the COVID-19 vaccine to reduce the risk of severe illnesses. For the News on PBCJ, I'm Simone Absalom Gale. Prime Minister Andrew Holness has indicated that schools could resume face-to-face -face classes come September if the number of COVID-19 cases do not increase. However, there has been a spike in the number of cases in the last two weeks, coupled with reports of variants of the virus on the island. Speaking in Parliament on Wednesday, Education Minister Favol Williams says her ministry is prepared for any eventuality as it relates to the reopening of schools. So in the case where we can be back in the face-to-face -face environment. For schools that have a lot of students, the directive has been to use the blended approach, where, as you said, there'll be some students coming in day one, others day two, and some students are online and you rotate. So that is, that is the approach that we're looking at for our schools in the cases where uh, their capacity, they're at capacity or over capacity in terms of students. Of course, there are many schools that are under capacity and so would be able to accommodate um, students for face to face. The minister says consultations are still taking place with the various regions. 
Prime Minister Andrew Holness has said that new measures might be announced next week, Tuesday, as the country appears to be in the early stage of a third wave of infections. The report of the Joint Select Committee on the National Identification and Registration Act 2020 has been approved. The House of Representatives gave the nod on Tuesday. This legislation makes provision for a voluntary and secure national identification system, NIDS, for Jamaica. The Prime Minister says enrollment would be voluntary and the system will be monitored by an established authority. This new bill seeks to establish the independent oversight body as a commission of parliament to ensure that the authority is compliant with the National Identification and Registration Act. As a commission of parliament, the oversight body will be autonomous in carrying out its functions and will only answer to parliament. In addition to a stronger independent body to monitor the NIDS authority, Mr. Holness says other checks and balances have been put in place. The collection of only minimum identity information, greater data protection and security mechanisms, and for a more appropriate offence regime with penalties that reflect the gravity of breaches of the legislation. The Prime Minister says steps will be taken to educate the nation about NIDS. Over the next couple of months, the NIDS Project Executing Unit will be embarking on a series of sessions to explain the legislation and educate Jamaicans about the NIDS and its benefits. Let me remind the public that they can also learn more about the NIDS and its identity by logging on to nidsfacts.com. Motorists can expect to pay less at the pumps this week. We share details on the Credit Restoration Virtual Summit and take a look at a courtesy call to the World Bank team from Prime Minister Andrew Holness. This plus regular market details in this extended business report. On Wednesday, Prime Minister Andrew Holness had a high-level meeting with representatives from the World Bank. So I, I think the next frontier of um, deep cooperation between Jamaica and the World Bank will be in this area of the development of human resources. Uh, and there are some subsets of that which we would want to pay critical attention to, and that is the creation of a digital society. And that has many elements to it, obviously. Uh, there are some infrastructure issues that we have to address. Uh, and one of them uh, is the development of a broadband uh, network backbone for the country that would ensure that access to the internet is uh, reliable, available, and affordable. The Prime Minister was accompanied by Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark, Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade Minister Kamina Johnson-Smith, Industry and Commerce Minister Audley Shaw, and Information Minister Favel Williams. The World Bank team was led by Vice President of Latin America and the Caribbean region, Carlos Caramillo. The team also included Country Director for Caribbean Countries, Lilia Brunswick, Resident Representative for Guyana and Jamaica, Ozan Savimili, and Country Manager for the Caribbean, Judith Green. Prime Minister Holness said, quote, Jamaica and the World Bank have had a very strong and impactful relationship, which has yielded many great outcomes. We are happy for the continued partnership with the World Bank to pursue development in multiple areas across our country, end quote. Regional Vice President of the World Bank, Carlos Caramillo, pledged the World Bank's support towards a better, more resilient future for Jamaica. The meeting comes days after the World Bank International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, IBRD, priced a catastrophe bond that will give the Jamaican government financial protection of up to 185 million U.S. dollars against losses from named storms for three Atlantic tropical cyclone seasons ending in December 2023. Jamaica is the first government in the Caribbean region and the first small island state in the world to independently sponsor a catastrophe bond. Minister of Finance and the Public Service Dr. Nigel Clark on Wednesday announced that the World Bank will be relocating their Caribbean regional head office from Washington, D.C. in the United States to Kingston, Jamaica. In a Twitter thread, he indicated that the bank will, quote, continue to serve the Caribbean, including Jamaica, from their regional headquarters in Kingston, end quote. 
Dr. Clark said he looks forward to welcoming the entire World Bank Caribbean Department to Kingston later this year. Effective Thursday, July 22, motorists can expect to pay less at the pumps for gasoline and diesel. According to the latest ex-refinery costs from Petrojam, 87 and 90 octane gasoline will be sold for $153.36 and $161.70 per litre, respectively after decreases of $2.34 and $2.29. Following a decrease of $2.20, automotive diesel fuel will be sold for $143.90. Ultra-low sulfur diesel is down by $2.09 and will be sold for $152.86. Kerosene saw a price drop of $3.06 and will be sold for $122.14 per litre. Propane liquid petroleum saw no change and will be sold for $64.71 per litre. After an increase of $0.25, cents, butane liquid petroleum will be sold for $74.39 per litre. Be on the lookout for price changes as marketing companies and retailers will add their markup to these prices. Bringing dignity to consumer debt. On July 22 and 23, Jamaicans will be able to access a wealth of information about credit repair at the Caribbean Credit Repair Association CCRA Credit Restoration Virtual Summit. The two-day summit is hosted by financial coach and president of the CCRA, Denise Williams. It will be streamed on the financially focused Facebook page and YouTube channel and rebroadcast right here on PBCJ. Speakers at the event will include the Minister of Industry, Investment and Commerce, Audley Shaw, President and Chief Executive Officer of First Global Bank, Maria McIntosh Robinson, and Managing Director at the Jamaica Stock Exchange, Marlene Street Forest. Topics that will be discussed in the two-day summit include the credit report industry, credit restoration, insolvency, and resources for small businesses to recover from COVID-19. In Wednesday's trading session, the JSE Combined Index advanced by 1,752 points to close at over 421,000 units. Overall, market activity resulted from trading in 95 stocks, of which 39 advanced, 45 declined, and 11 traded firm. The Junior Market Index declined by 22 points to close at over 3,000 units. Stocks advanced for 1834 Investments Limited, AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited, and Barita Investments Limited. Stocks declined for Access Financial Services Limited, Blue Power Group Limited, and Caribbean Assurance Brokers Limited. Trading firm were 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, Carreras Limited, and Community and Workers of Jamaica CCU Deferred Share. Future Energy Source Company Limited Ordinary Shares was the volume leader with over 2.1 million units, followed by Trans Jamaican Highway Limited with over 2 million units, and Trans Jamaican Highway Limited USD with over 1 million units. In foreign exchange trading for Wednesday, July 21, the U.S. dollar sold for an average $154.85. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $125.93. The pound sterling traded for $212.90 and the euro sold for an average $185.08. In market data for oil, prices fell on Thursday after an unexpected rise in U.S. crude oil inventories and as rising COVID-19 infections threatened demand, but prices held on to most of their gains from the previous session on expectations that supplies will remain tight through year-end. Brent crude futures fell 32 cents to settle at $71.91 a barrel. West Texas intermediate crude fell 27 cents to $70.03 a barrel. In regional news, do not let Trinidad and Tobago reach another deadly milestone. This message from Health Minister Terence Dialsing after the country recorded 1,000 deaths due to COVID-19 on Tuesday. Reporter Sunil Lala was at the launch of a mass drive through vaccination site in the country where the minister once again urged members of the population to get inoculated. So in mourning those 1,000 deaths, we should tell the population that we could avoid another terrible milestone if we believe the science that says that vaccinations save lives. 
Speaking at the launch of another mass vaccination site in Wallerfield on Wednesday, Health Minister Terence Yelsing says the ministry and by extension the government is making it easier for many to get vaccinated by adding mass vaccination sites across the country. He notes the 800,000 Sinopharm vaccines received recently keeps Trinidad and Tobago on track to inoculate as many people as quickly as possible. He also believes more people would be inclined to get vaccinated with the addition of these drive through sites. The more options you give people, the more segments of the population you reach. Some may prefer this because they don't have to come out. So an elderly person doesn't have to come out and walk with a crutch or a cane. This race truck in Wallerfield is the latest site to be transformed into a drive through mass vaccination site. From as early as 8 a.m., people were lined up outside of this facility waiting to receive their first jab of the vaccine. And CEO of the NCRHA, Davlin Thomas, says they expect to vaccinate at least 2,500 people for today. So we have some excess, excess capacity, but um, basically around 2,500 persons. Today we'll do less. We're really doing some testing of the system, tweaking. And by tomorrow, we already have, we're already booked at a, P, a rate of about 90 per hour. The Wallerfield Racetrack Mass Vaccination Site had several checkpoints for registration, verification, vaccination and an observation tent where people waited in their vehicles and were instructed to blink their lights if they experienced any abnormal side effects. So Lala, TTT News. Schools in St. Lucia are set and ready to roll out the Caribbean Primary Education Exit Assessment, CPEA. That's according to the president of the Principals Association, Valerie Santelen Henry. HTS News Force caught up with Henry following the release of the latest Common Entrance Examination results. The CPEA is to replace the Common Entrance exams in the island. The Principals Association of St. Lucia is hoping that the CXC Examinations Council could ease up on the deadlines for certain components of the Caribbean Primary Education Exit Assessment, CPEA. The common entrance examinations will be no more come 2022 and will instead be replaced by the CPEA. The module evaluates the literacy levels of primary school leavers and encompasses two components. The external components will be administered by the Caribbean Examinations Council. President of the Principals Association, Valerie St. Helen Henry, says the deadlines for various aspects of the evaluation may be too rigid. We are usually resilient. We are able to overcome the challenges. However, CPA is a totally di it's totally different. It's been managed at the CXC level, and that is the the downside of of the situation that we are in. In that, with the ministry, they may be able to change deadlines. But with CXC, there's a, a timeline that you have to submit certain components of CPA at a certain time, and and that is the sad part that CXC need to come to grips with reality because uh, we know what has been happening in the region not only in St. Lucia and I think they should reconsider some of the deadlines that they have given for some of the components. Henry believes that the CPEA is the way to go as common entrance is a thing of the past. She says the CPEA will help students transition to secondary school. It does not only give the children this one day exposure to determine which school they go to, but as they journey from grade 5 to grade 6, they would need some development in terms of the expressive writing. So the, you have samples of their, their, their writing, expressive writing. The, the, uh, we have a book report, um, their projects, you know, and it also prepares them for secondary school as well. Because when they get to the secondary school, we know they are working towards CXC, which has the, the, the SBA components and so on. So I think it, it's, it's a smooth kind of transition. It will do a smooth transition for the girls when they get into secondary school. So they would be accustomed with being um, tested in, in terms of using rubrics to, to you look at their, their projects, to look at certain aspects of the expressive writing, you know. So as they move into secondary school, it will not be too much of a, a change for them. 
Meanwhile, the Camille Henry Memorial School has assured parents that the institution will be prepared to execute the CPEA next year. Our students who are going to be going into grade 6, the parents of those students, there isn't a lot of time in terms of what is required for CPA, but I did reassure our parents just the last week of school that at Camille we will do all in our power to ensure that our students are prepared as best as we can get them prepared for the CPEA. Students will be assessed on their mathematical, language, civic and scientific skills. The internal element contributes to 40% of students' overall grades and has some eight activities. It allows educators some level of autonomy to test students within the classroom environment. Gina Filippi, HTS News Force. In Grenada, the protest continues against forced vaccination by non-vaccinated workers who were sent home with no pay. Workers at Sandals have now joined with workers at SGU to protest for what they claim is their right to work. Sandals Resorts non-vaccinated workers have joined the forces with the non-vaccinated workers at SGU as they all protested in the south of the island against forced vaccination. The Sanders Resort workers said they too were sent home by their employers with no pay. Chelson Miller, a diving instructor at the resort, said they were told that if they don't get vaccinated, they are not allowed to come back to work and will not be paid off for their years of service. Yeah, because we're not going to sit back and be told that, hey, your hotel is going to be delisted so you have to vaccinate 100% of your staff and then tell the staff that, hey, you guys need to be vaccinated and if you don't want to be vaccinated, you're going to go home and stay home without pay for three months. And after the three months, it'll be like you forfeit your job. So don't come back. We feel that, that that's threatening to the highest level. That's victimization to the highest point, And we're not going to stand for it. All the workers, along with supporters, gathered at a bus stop near the sugar mill roundabout with their placards and music to enlighten the public on their fight. Miller believes that with the joint forces of SGU, their voices will be heard. Today, we decided to make a stance to fight for our rights because we feel that we are being victimized. We feel that we have not been dealt with fairly in terms of our positions at Sandals, the Sandals workers that's here today especially. And we think if we join forces with SGU, our voices would be heard a bit easier or louder. Meanwhile, it's been two months since the non-vaccinated workers at SGU have been protesting for their cause. One SGU employee, Raleigh Duncan, says that with no pay, the financial situation they are faced with is not of the best. But this will not deter them from speaking out and fighting for what they believe in. Right, we are moving to the parish of St. John on Friday. We are taking this right around the island. If we realize the government and the powers that be, they are the ones that is moving swiftly towards having persons vaccinated. Right, we are not, as I said, against vaccination, but vaccination should be a choice. The workers are calling on everyone to join the protests and support the cause. For GBN News, I am Rena Pet Thomas reporting. Over now to sports. Theodore Suba, you may not know the name, but he has created history by becoming the first visually impaired para-athlete to represent Jamaica at the Paralympics. He will represent the island in the area of judo. The Paralympics will be held in Tokyo from August 24 to September 3. Carol Francis has that report. When we visited the Sir John Golding Rehabilitation Center, we found Theodore Suba and his coach in a sparring session. I am the first Jamaican Paralympic judoka for Jamaica. I have been doing this sport close to three years now. And it has been a very, I would want to say, up and down journey, but a good one nevertheless. 
Jamaica Olympic Association President Christopher Samuda was on hand and welcomed what he called a landmark moment for the local Paralympian movement. This has been a landmark for the Paralympic movement in terms of our training ground and certainly it has marked the achievements of our para-athletes throughout the years. And today we are celebrating with Theodore Subo, who has made an historic feat. He is now a Paralympian and he has qualified for the Paralympic Games, which will of course commence next month and will end in September. He has, he has qualified in the area of judo and we are absolutely pleased. The first para-athlete to do so in the history of the Paralympic Games. And therefore, we are going to go with optimism to the Paralympic Games. Judo was introduced as an Olympic sport for men at the Tokyo 1964 Games. Secretary General for the Jamaica Paralympic Association, Susan Harris-Henry, explains the grading for para-judo athletes. For judo in the Paralympic Games, all the athletes have a visually visual impairment all right and by that we mean they cannot some are blind as in completely blind and others have different degrees of visual impairment we have three classes b1 b2 and b3 our athlete is in the b3 class now persons might be seeing paralympics visual impairment we actually the paralympic games is for athletes with a physical disability and visual impairment so you know this is actually our first visually impaired athlete that we're taking to the paralympic games we've taken them to other games before but never at this level so this is a first in many respects for us head coach of the jamaica paralympic judo team is stephen moore he has worked closely with Theodore over the years, and he gauges his chances in Tokyo. What we're aiming for is a medal. That's what we're aiming for. We're aiming to at least medal. Um, essentially, he's, I would say, the youngest, not, in, not only in age, but he's the youngest in terms of newest to the sport on the world stage in his weight category, and that has qualified for the um, Paralympic Games in his category. Um, so I would say his chances are... Optimist, being optimistic, I'd say they are good, but I'm not going to be blindly optimistic and say he's coming back home with a goal, but that is what we're aiming towards. My expectations is to come back with a medal. It doesn't matter which medal, because this is my first time. I don't want to go blindly and say, yo, I have to come back with a goal. You know? I mean, it would be very good if I come back with a goal, but my aim now is to just go there, garner some experience, and also come back with a medal, because I don't want to go there just to make up numbers. That's not my aim. Coach Moore says COVID-19 greatly affected their preparations for the Games. We were to have competitions last year and then the Paralympic Games were to be held last year. Of course, that was put off. Those qualification events, a lot of them were cancelled or postponed. Uh, the Games we went to, the qualification Games we went to in June in Warwick just, just a couple weeks ago. That was postponed from last year. So it really put a damper on our progress. And of course, you know, judo is a contact sport, as you saw, as you'd see in the clips. We're right up in each other's face, so it was very hard to have training sessions. So what we had to do, we had to, the, the new word, this, the new buzzword since last year, pivot. You're talking about a 10-month almost break from the sport before we were able to get into it as we wanted to. Despite all the obstacles, Theodore Suba has managed to hurdle them all. He expressed gratitude to all who have helped him on his tremendous journey. It's not me alone who contributes to this success now. So I'd like to thank the JOA and the JPA, friends and family supporters, who all played a vital role in me getting to where I am, and I am now. Whatever the outcome of his journey to Tokyo, Theodore Suba, by virtue of his achievement thus far, has already exemplified the Olympic motto, higher, faster, stronger, together. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Carol Francis. And that's our package. Join us tomorrow, same time and place for more news right here on PBCJ, the People's Station.